I guess I worked for 10 or 12 years before I ever found out that management was supposed to help you. I always thought management was kind of a punishment from God. Bill Crosby is one of the world's leading authorities on the management of quality in business and industry. He's worked in the field for over 30 years on everything from missiles to washing machines. For over 15 years, he was a vice president of the ITT Corporation, where he had total responsibility for the company's quality throughout the world. Now he's president of his own quality college in Winter Park, Florida. There, they teach the management of quality improvement to thousands of senior executives from companies like IBM, Borg Warner, and General Motors. We caught up with him on a recent golfing holiday in Scotland, and what follows are some of his personal views on the management of quality in business and industry. All the good golfers play to the rules. Everybody I've ever known who is a good golfer all the professionals, all the low handicappers, obey the rules exactly. And because of that, they know that every stroke counts, and every shot counts, and if you do something uh, undesirable, you have to live with it. If you hit it in the rough, you have to hit it out of the rough. And the high handicap golfers have their own rules. They have the uh, carried away by a wild animal rule. They can't find it in the rough. They drop one in the fairway because it must have been carried away. They have the buried under a leaf. They have the uh, gimmies. They give the putts. Uh, the professionals don't give anything away. Oh, oh hit it over. Well, as long as you can do that, see, as long as you don't have to suffer the consequences of your acts, then you don't have to get serious about it. And serious golf makes uh, better golf. Now, that's the same thing is true in management. As long as management uh, can sign waivers, off specs, deviations, procedural changes, things like that, and deliver to the customers non-conforming material with little pieces of paper that says it's okay, then they never get serious. Now, people ask me, why are the Japanese so good at, at quality, for instance? And it's not all these uh, systems you read about, and it's not this 5,000-year-old culture, because it used to make junk before uh, World War II, if you remember. It's really a matter of they take it seriously. They take the requirements very seriously. If you go to the president of a, a British company or uh, most American companies and say to them, this is not quite round enough, uh, but we can use it anyway, they will say to you, what does engineering say? And if engineering says okay, they use it. If you go to Mr. Honda and say that, he will whip out a ceremonial sword and slice you right in half. So he doesn't want to do that. You have to get clear with it, and that's the only difference. This business of the, the wind being a big factor in the golf course is not something I'm used to. And the, uh, you hit the ball in the air and the wind does whatever it wants to do. It is a little windy, that's for sure. Yeah. There's a, there aren't any trees or anything to... Nothing that's to That's what cut we it could down. do. We could sell them trees. We could come out and we could bring the whole forest of trees and sell them sell, to the Nearfield Man. Sell them a few oaks, right? Yeah, right down each side of the thing. You figure, let's see, 10 bucks a tree. I think one of the big problems with quality in the manufacturing and service business is that nobody's really against it. Everybody's all for quality. And you can't find anybody that doesn't want to do it. And you would think perhaps that more of it would happen. They're not only uh, naive about quality, but uh, uh, people rationalize it. For instance, we had a case where the, uh, uh, they're putting a new bridge across the Hudson River, and the, and the governor of New York came down to, to put in the golden spike. And as he reached out to the, uh, uh, to the girder, there was no hole in the end of the girder. So he palmed the spike and, the, and then gave it back to the chairman and irascibly went off the bridge. And they called the, the factory and sent the quality control man down and he came down and he, and he climbed out over the river and he looked at this girder and he examined the serial number, went back, called the factory and he came back and he announced to the chairman, he said there was a hole in that when it left the factory. Well, that's of course a story, but, but that's what happens. People make up about quality. They don't face it, they don't take it seriously. What? 
There are four things we call the absolutes of quality management, the concepts that you absolutely have to understand if you're going to change anything. You have to know what's the definition of quality? Uh, what does it really mean? What system do you use to, to uh, make quality happen? What performance standard do you give people so that they cannot misunderstand it? And how do you measure quality in management terms, some meaningful way that they can get it? Now, let's take them one at a time. What's the definition of quality? The conventional definition of quality is goodness, beauty, truth, weight, uh, you know, something you know when you see it. And those are all nice things to say, but you can't manage that. Quality has to mean conformance to requirements. When you ask somebody to do it right the first time, you have to tell them what it is. It is the requirements. It is drill the hole one inch plus or minus 10,000. It is answer the phone before it rings three times. It is uh, turn on at 8 o'clock, whatever. That's the requirement. So a Rolls Royce that conforms to all its requirements is a quality car. A Mini that conforms to all its requirements is a quality car. See, it's not comparative. You don't have good quality, bad quality, high quality, low quality. Quality is what are the requirements and conformance to it. That's the first absolute of quality management. The second absolute refers to the system. Now, the system of quality that's used now is appraisal. You inspect and test and fix and inspect and test and fix until the thing is finally done and then away it goes. That's very expensive and also destructive. What we want to do is prevention. We get it up straight up front, and get clear what we're going to do, and make it all come out right. For instance, if you're talking about an omelet, you know, somebody's going to cook an omelet or a chocolate mousse or so forth, you can't wait until it's all done and then sit down with the customer and decide if it's right. Is there enough sugar in it, uh, there enough eggs or whatever? It has to be dealt with uh, as it's being made. That's prevention. Third is performance standard. Uh, conventionally, we talk about uh, acceptable quality levels. How good does something have to be? And they're all measured out in very precise numbers, but really what that means is you don't have to do it right. You don't have to do it right the first time. What we want is everybody should do it right the first time, it meaning the requirements that I talked about. So we say we should have a performance standard of defect-free, Z defects, zero defects, ZD, meaning do it right the first time. So the people know what the management wants. Management makes it clear. If management goes around saying that's good enough to worry about that, get a, we'll worry about this next week, we'll do that, then what you get is garbage. Then how do you measure quality? Well, this is one of the interesting things about it. Uh, m most management courses and, and colleges teach you can't measure quality. It's just one of those things. If you spend too much on, money on it, you don't make money. We talk about quality in terms of, 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 of financial responsibility. How much does it cost you to be bad? What is the rework? What is the service? What is the warranty? What does it take to chase people around and, and, and get things right again? Uh, we just built a new house, and everything we <coughs> in the house had to come back and get fixed again. Every, every single thing, somebody had to come back. They did it cheerfully and happily, but service uh, is expensive, and you get no money for it. So. We see in manufacturing companies that they spend 25 and 30 percent of their sales doing things over and again. Service companies, it's 40 to 50 percent of their cost of operations that they waste. This is actual wasted money. The management doesn't realize that quality is as important as finance or marketing or these other things. They just sort of leave it up to somebody. <laughs> No, I'm saying the quality manager, and I was one for a long time, uh, really is very powerless on this. So, well, the quality manager can do is sort the good from the bad, complain about it, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, once you, when you're sorting, when you're looking at it, it's all done. It's all over with. Uh, the quality manager uh, uh, learns to say over and over again uh, to top management, this is just not right. And the management says, no, no, just uh, sort it out the best you can. Our level is good. See, our level is good. We have to take a whole uh, great leap forward in this business. This business of an acceptable quality level is passe. The quality control people uh, just do not have the knowledge or the power to know how to change this thing. It's a management. It's like finance. Now, years ago, 
finance was uh, you had a cigar box, you put the money in, and, and at the end of the month you had your money left, that was a profit. Now finance is a very big complicated thing. The accountants are controllers, and they sit on the board of directors, and, and, and they make great decisions about this. Well, quality has to be thought of the same way. Not that you need somebody with a lot of power to make it happen, but it's a senior management responsibility. They take uh, finance serious, you know, they take the business of making money and paying the bills seriously. They take the business of deliveries uh, seriously. They take the business of purchasing seriously. We need to take quality seriously. For instance, the suppliers. Very few companies sit down with their suppliers and work out an arrangement with them where they will deliver to them defect-free material routinely over a period of time so they can use it, so they can keep the inventories short. Uh, all they do with suppliers is to find the cheapest one and buy it and figure they're doing, uh, doing well. That's archaic. That's archaic. These things have to be thought about, and they have to be handled. And it's all part of quality. It's all part of making it all come out uh, right the first time. Management action is what makes that happen. Now, well, the whole business of quality it, it revolves around management style and, and the culture of the company. I like to equate it to something, like, for instance, like ballet and hockey. You know, ballet is, is a, something that's put together uh, out of a script, and it's a, a story that is, uh, 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 that is laid out exactly. A symphony uh, that's written perhaps by one of the old masters, and then the theater. So the, uh, the script tells the story like a uh, young princess is uh, taken away uh, by a magician to a castle and rescued by a young prince and removed in a swan boat. And so the, uh, the dancers practice this choreography. The uh, uh, set people build the theater uh, set. The symphony is working uh, in another theater, perhaps another hall, practicing. And then they all come together. And the director says uh, to the uh, ballerina, for instance, says, Nanatushka, this little spot here on the stage, he says, when uh, at the sixth bar of the symphony, you have to hit that spot with your right foot and you go up on your toes and we will light you with a, a white spotlight. And then Ivanov will come over and pick you up and deposit you in the swan boat, at which time we will light you with a blue spotlight. And we practice that. So they do that and, and the director says, now we didn't get that quite right. According to the requirements, we didn't do it quite right. You missed the spot. And she says, well, I'm, I'm dancing without my contacts. Perhaps we could make the spot a little bigger. And she says, okay, we'll do that so that you can meet it. And the, uh, he said, we didn't get the blue spotlight. The man says, well, the one switch is over there and the one switch is over there, I can't reach. So what we'll do is we'll uh, make it accommodation so that they can reach the switches. And they practice and they get it right. And that's the way they do it. And they do it that way every performance, and it's predictable. Everybody in the cast knows that at that exact moment in the, in the uh, symphony, she's gonna hit that spot, he's gonna pick her up, the swan boat comes out, and the lights are gonna change. They all know that, and they can practice it that way. That's ballet, that's management where everybody understands what's going on and everybody supports each other. That's the kind we want. Now, what we really have is, is hockey management. Now, hockey's a wonderful game, and I really enjoy it, but it's not a very good management style. Because in the hockey, everybody has a uniform. Everybody knows their place in the organization. Everybody gets all set. They drop the puck on the ice, and they take off uh, chasing the puck around. And every, every hockey game is an original experience, which, of course, is the whole, the whole idea. It's an original experience. But nobody uh, knows what's going to happen at the sixth bar of the symphony. Nobody knows what's going to happen in there. So you can't predict it. And every day at the end of the, of the work day, all the management people drop exhausted in their chair uh, with a sense of satisfaction of having accomplished something. The fact that they've solved the same problem over again for the 300th time uh, doesn't uh, bother them. They think it's inevitable. But ballet is possible. Ballet is possible. When we set the requirements clearly, when we uh, explain them to the people and educate them and give them the wherewithal, and when we help each other. That's what management style is all about. You get four, you have to take a four and a half to your son to get up to the right-hand side of the trap. Okay. So there's a gap bring it in. It gives you the next shot. Anyway. Wind will bring it in if I get it up. Right to left, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it really comes down to people try to evaluate how serious management is about something. And the, the credibility of the management commitment is what's involved. For instance, like, well, like in playing golf here, uh, when you have a caddy, the relationship between the golfer and the caddy is pretty much up uh, to the golfer. 
Well, when Watson plays here, he just nips the ball just underneath, the, just at the back of the ball. Hardly takes any of it at all. Just uh, nicks it right out. Yeah. Well, that's good enough for Watson. It's good enough for me. Yeah. Caddy knows a lot more about the course and a lot more about probably about golf than the golfer. And they will work with you uh, depending on how serious they think you are, how much you want to play, how, how hard you want to work at it. And so they'll sit down and they'll line up the putt with you, show you where to go, or they'll just hand you the putter and stand back. They take it, they take it from you, from what, what you have to say. And this management puts it forth. The management wanders around saying, oh, that's close enough to worry about that. Well, people just won't understand, you know. Uh, customers, I'm in customers, uh, what do they know? And all this sort of thing. Then the people pick that up. Management is very domineering, like in, in meetings. I, I think that the, 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 the biggest problem with senior management always is they, they don't listen. They sit down at the table and they start talking, and they say the same things over and over again and stuff, they don't learn anything. Management should go to the meeting and keep their mouth shut, and listen to the other things, and if they get something to say, say it in a couple minutes and, and, and get it over with. It, it, I always thought, you know, I was, I guess I worked for 10 or 12 years before I ever found out that management was supposed to help you. I always thought management was kind of a punishment from God, and, and, and uh, hopefully my, my subordinates don't, don't feel that way. And I was really working in a men's uh, clothing store that I, 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 part-time when I was working as an engineer and wasn't making enough money, that I began to realize that, that management would help you. And these people that ran this store would have classes after work, and they would bring in clothing uh, merchants and shoe merchants I mean, to show you uh, how these things were made and, and uh, so, so you could explain to the customer better. Uh, hardly anybody, for instance, uh, wears the right size shoes because nobody knows how to fit shoes. They fit them just to the end of the toe, and that's not the way you do it. And I remember the, the, the man showing me, for instance, uh, when a customer went out with a suit box under his arm, and he went past the tie counter. And, and he looked at the tie counter, and I said, may I help you? And he said, no, thank you, and went out the door. And the, and the uh, uh, owner came over and said to me, now, Phil, the way you do this is you say to him, that would go very nice with a gray suit. And I said, how do I know he's got a gray suit? And he said, well, you look back at the cashier, and the cashier will tell you, blue, brown, gray. See? And then you know what to say. Well, they were helping me. And we're helping the customer get the suit out of the box. Let's try out some ties. Everybody needs some ties with a new suit. That's not what it's done. We, you this business of, of roles, you know, that management is uh, this and the little people are that and some of the kind of stuff. That's, that's not the way it has to be. We all have to communicate, uh, particularly in the service business, like hotels and banks. You, know, you go to a bank all your life and never meet anybody important. You deal with all the lower levels. And if the people who really run the bank don't talk to those folks and don't communicate with them and don't tell them their role, then nobody will ever know it. Nobody will ever know what it is. So really, the whole business of quality is management has to make very clear requirements, or as you folks say, objectives, so that everybody understands what they are. This is what we are going to do. Then get an agreement on that. Yes, we can do that. And here are the tools you need. No matter how enthusiastic I am or how motivated I am, I cannot lift 2,000 pounds. You've got to give me something to do with it. Or I can't get from uh, uh, London to Paris in eight minutes. Uh, it, it just can't be done. So I need tools and I need uh, ways of doing things. Then management needs to encourage and to help. You know, in our company, I go, I want, we have 120 people down in Winter Park. And I go around every day and I see everybody. Everybody that's there isn't traveling some. And I just chat with them. And if they have a problem, they tell me about it. And I go do something about it. I don't uh, go follow each one, but I go and I find this person is not getting things from the stock room right. And I go to the stock room and find out that they don't know about that. And so management has to be like a bee going from flower to flower to flower, carrying the pollen around. You have to be very careful uh, when you talk about quality and communications to make sure you understand what you're talking about. I tell a story on myself when I was with ITT. I was sitting in my office one day and I received a telephone call and a fellow said, I'm looking for the corporate quality director. And I said, that's me. And he said, well, he said, we haven't met. He said, I, my name is Bill Campbell, and I run the aerospace division out here in Los Angeles. He said, we've got this terrible problem. He said, we're making uh, a theodolite for the NASA Jupiter probe, and they are really upset with us about the lousy quality that your people have made us hack have. And he said, they're coming in here Monday, and they're going to plow the ground with salt, burn a building, and the whole place is going to be all over. And it's just all. I said, OK, wait a minute. Tell me, tell me the, all about it. So he told me this long, involved story, and I said, and I really think that you and NASA don't understand each other. 
I, th I think that uh, there's a communication problem here, and I'll see if I can help you. So I, I'll go down this afternoon to Washington and meet with the NASA headquarters people and you know, get their side of the story. And then, then I'll take the late plane down to uh, Houston, spend the day at the Lyndon Johnson Laboratory, and that'll get me into Los Angeles about 2 o'clock Saturday morning, and I'll go out to your plant. You leave your office open. I'll catch a couple hours sleep on the couch. You bring your staff in Saturday and Sunday. We'll work out a corrective action system so that when NASA comes in on Monday, we'll just knock them dead with the corrective action, and we'll really get it fixed. We'll really get the problem fixed because it has to be right. Oh, my goodness, he said, that's, that's just going to be so wonderful. He said, I never dreamed I'd get so much help from the corporate seagulls. I said, Seagull, what's this corporate Seagull? He's always, I'm sorry, he says, that's what we staff people call the headquarters chaps. He says, you know, they, uh, they fly in, they eat your food, they squawk a lot, they crap all over you, and then they fly away. He said, and he said we, uh, but he said, I said, well, we try not to be Seagulls here in quality. So he said, well, Grace, I'm going to make sure Mr. Allison understands all of the, the, the things that you're doing, giving up your weekend and the late night flights and sleeping on the couch and everything. And I said, uh, well, thank you very much, but who's Mr. Allison? There's a little pause, and he said, well, Mr. Allison is the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of the corporation. I said, Mr. Janine is the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of the corporation. There's another pause, and he said, isn't this Plaza 28000? And I said, uh, no, it's 26000, this is IDT. And there's another pause, and he said, does that mean you're not going to come? <laughs> well, this is, a, of course, a story of, of uh, mix-up in communications. Well, that's what quality is all about. Quality is a matter of taking communication seriously, explaining to the people what you want, explaining to each other what you want, getting it all straight up front, and making sure everybody knows how to do it. put forth five uh, characteristics of companies that have problems with quality always. Uh, and the first one is, is that they always uh, uh, don't do things right. Whatever they deliver, there's always a tag on it that says something, or, there, or it's, it just isn't quite done uh, properly. It's almost like they have a policy that way. The second thing comes from the first thing, and, and this is that they need a field service, or they need a dealership, or they need some sort of follow-up thing to get things straight after it's, it's all done. The third is they don't have a clear performance standard. They don't have it defect-free, or they don't say, we're going to do it right the first time. They, they have a sort of, a, we're going to give service, or we're going to talk about excellence, or something which doesn't, doesn't mean anything. The fourth is they don't know what all this costs. They don't realize that they're spending 25% of their, of their sales dollar doing things wrong. And the last thing, and probably the most uh, 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 sincere one, is, is that management does not accept the responsibility for all of this. They blame it on the public school system, they blame it on the government, they blame it on the Japanese, they blame it on the unions, they blame it on everybody but themselves. And they're the only ones that can fix it. And all that comes down to, if management's serious about it, they have to show they're serious about it. Because the people are a reflection. You look at the people, and if the people are not serious, you know the management's not serious. Or, if management's serious, the people don't believe they're serious. So it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. Benefits of quality management are very clear as far as a company and a country and an industry go, and that's the reduced hassle, improved profit, happier people. But the real benefit to me is the personal one. You know, when you don't have to battle old problem number 36 every day, you got time to relax and take a holiday in a nice place and play golf with some friends. <laughs> 